is Linda Lord. And uh, I decided back in 2013 that I wanted to write to be heard as opposed to write to be read. And it's a fairly, it's a fairly subtle distinction and yet a huge distinction at the same time. When we write to be read, we're writing for the page. And tonight, more or less, we are going to be talking about writing for the page uh, when we talk about writing our memoirs. Yeah, I got in. Um, but I, um, I do also write for uh, write to be heard, which is that I write for the stage. So I have done, let's see, one, two, three, minimum of three one woman shows, uh, local fringe festivals, uh, as well as um, as well as uh, a play for um, a professional down in California. So I've had that privilege. I have five produced plays um, that have been produced locally as well as participated in fringe festivals. And I also have written two books, um, 31 Days Toward Maximum Living, which is a self-help book and a second book called The Pitch, which is kind of memoir. I remember when I wrote it, I called it faction. It was some facts and some fiction, but I didn't tell people which was which. And it is about lessons learned, business lessons learned on the soccer pitch. So that gives you just a little bit of my background. I also have a PhD in expressive arts therapy using creativity, drama, and writing therapeutically um, to help people heal old wounds. So that's kind of my introduction. And now I'm going to open, open the chat and open the microphones for any of you that want to just let me know. How many of you, and you can raise your hands too, we've been on Zoom for, for a couple of years and this platform just, who has a book inside of them that they are just wanting to give birth to? Raise your hand, come off mute. Yes, excellent, Linda, glad to see you uh, sharing that. And is it a memoir? Dorothy, you've got a book inside of you that you want to write as well, that's fantastic. What's the nature of the book, Linda? Well, there are two different books, and the first book is about my husband's family. Um, at a time when no one heard of Afghanistan, I married an Afghan. And I married an Afghan whose family had been displaced during the succession of Pakistan from Greater India. And my husband, as a result, had a life that was lived in the nexus of Indian, Pakistani, and Afghan uh, politics. We met in Germany, and he came to Canada. And uh, for a, a boy who thought he was going to be a goat herder um, when he grew up, and who became the head of a biochemical laboratory in a hospital here in southwestern Ontario. It's been quite a road and I want to write that story um, with a, a, a bifocal purpose, one for my children and mm -hmm. then secondly for anyone else who might be interested in such a story. And then the second um, book is the one I want to, wanted to work on originally and it's the story of uh, my own family, a story which I have worked very hard to determine the facts of because so much of it was lost during the Holocaust. I, I now mm. have a grandson and I would like him to know where he comes from because I grew up without knowing where I came from and mm. it certainly has an impact, uh, a major impact on your life in ways that you would not realize why you're going through it you right. see everything in retrospect yeah great well i think tonight when we talk about perspective and choosing the most important things might be kind of relevant area for you to either focus on or to refocus on um, so thank you very much for sharing that linda uh dorothy i see your hand is still up did you want to comment on the the type of book you're going to write And you're still uh, it's definitely definitely a, a memoir. Uh, it's the story of my family's experience in Germany during and after the war. Okay, great. I'm old, yeah. And I'm old enough to uh, <laughs> to remember a lot of that. So. Okay, thank you. And again, the and we'll talk about this in a couple of moments. But the distinction between sort of autobiography and memoir. 
um, is significant to this conversation tonight as well. Um, Audra has put in the chat that yes, there's a memoir that wants to be written there. And Evelyn mentioned a memoir from recorded interviews with uh, their father made in the 90s. And I'm assuming the father was born in the early 1900s. So excellent. So glad that you're here and, and have those stories that are burning inside of us. We are storytelling creatures, right? I mean, we've been telling stories since birth, even pre-verbal, we tell stories by the sounds that we make. And, you know, the pictures on cave walls told the story of where to hunt and where to avoid. So we are social creatures, we're storytelling creatures. And the memoir is just one storytelling form that we use to share a particular time in our lives. So it is a narrative. And at any point, if you have, um, if you have any questions or comments, raise your hand, put them in the chat. I do want this to be fairly interactive. I'm, I'm here as a resource for you tonight. So it is so, a narrative written from your pers particular perspective. And because it's your perspective, how you view the events of your life, we have to acknowledge that there is going to be a bias, right? Because we're telling the story from our perspective, from our point of view, from the way that we experienced it. And if you're writing it from interviews of other people, right? Or if you're doing it um, uh, sort of the, uh, from your, uh, your husband's family, right? It's still going to be your perspective. It's going to be how you see those events and how they unfolded. So just own the bias. It's not a bad thing, right? It's when we write something thinking we don't have a bias that we get into trouble. Um, we all do. And so there might be a word that you choose that, that reveals what your bias is. There might be the title of the work that reveals your bias. Um, and, and as I said, that's okay. Just recognize that we all come from that perspective. We're all filtering our stories through our own experiences. Memoirs typically focus on a specific time period or an event rather than the entirety of a person's life. When we look at from birth to success or birth to downfall or birth to death, that is more autobiographical or biographical because we're taking that, that broad view. Autobiographies tend to, um, they tend to, to start with famous people or people who have famous stories or significant stories of overcoming hardships. Memoirs, on the other hand, we all can write because the tone and the intention of a memoir is significantly different than, um, than, an than an autobiography. So we also, it comes from the French word memory. And so we know that our own memories can be fallible. And because of uh, work in psychology and mental health, I know that memories can be planted as well. There is such a thing as false memory. And so when we're writing a memoir and knowing that that comes from memory, um, at, at least our interpretation of the event is from our memory, it may be fallible. And that is one of the sort of saving graces of a memoir over an autobiography, because a memoir, we know that it is written from a person's perspective and it is written based on a particular time and it's written based on a memory of a lived experience. And so there's more latitude there in terms of sort of publishers and criticisms, because it is coming from that place of, yes, it's fact, but there might be aspects of it that may be embellished upon, maybe um, take on some of the creative writing components, um, as opposed to its being strictly fact. Does that make sense? That it does give you a little bit more room um, to remember things and interpret them rather than it being a chronological depiction of, of the events specific, specifically uh, rooted in data. And memoirs also tend to focus on a particular idea or a theme. So I don't know if any of you are familiar or have had um, an opportunity to hear a new trainer or a new motivational speaker or a new professor or a new pastor or minister of a church, but it's like everything that they've learned and everything that they've acquired goes into this one speech or this one lecture or this one sermon in case they're never asked to speak again, right? And the problem is you kind of leave the event or the class or the church service going, there was a lot of stuff there, but I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to remember. So we don't want that to happen with your memoir. We want you to have a particular theme or a particular idea 
that really anchors the, the memoir. So it might be, what is the overarching theme that you want people to know about the Holocaust experience? Choose one thing and focus on that. What is the thing about your, uh, your husband's family or your father's interviews? As we look at our lives, what is that thing, that idea or that theme that most resonates with who you want to write for? A memoir is also a writing style that allows the author to select and shape the facts to explore their themes. So you might not write about every single thing that happened to you, even within that event. You want to shape and select the most relevant, the most prominent, the most meaningful elements of the events around this time period that reinforces the theme, that reinforces the idea that you want to share with folks. So why write this memoir? Many of you have, have shared what it is that you want to accomplish, right? You want to have for family recollection, for family history. Sometimes it's just the starting place is to identify the threads and the themes and the patterns in our lives. So we take a look at everything around this particular event in our lives or, or years, so several events, right? But, but a time period. So what are the themes here? What are the patterns? The work that I do in expressive arts therapy and in expressive arts coaching helps people to identify these themes and patterns. Why do we keep doing these same things over and over again? So we're looking for our trends. And as you're writing your memoir, you are also going to be looking for the trends and patterns in the elements of the stories that you wanna share. I said a few minutes ago that we're storytellers. We are also meaning makers. When things happen to us and there are events in our lives that, that don't make meaning, they don't make sense to us, we really struggle with those things. And I mean, we've kind of been living that the last couple of years, right? It just, some things just don't make sense to us the last couple of years. And as you're focusing on your memoir and on your writing, how do we make meaning of these events? How do we make meaning so that I understand it I can point to it and say, yeah, that's the reason that happened or that's the meaning that I can take from that. So we can anchor into that and move forward. We can also use it to heal old wounds and to offer support to those with similar experiences. We know from the research and the work done by Dr. Penna Baker, who is um, a social psychologist, that 15 minutes of therapeutic writing for four consecutive days can actually help us to heal old emotional wounds. Um, that's scientifically based. I know that it's used for cancer patients a lot, again, to help them create meaning from their experience. And memoirs, because of the very nature of what they are intended to do, not only heal our own old, our own old wounds, that's a tongue twister, but also offers support for those who have lived similar experiences. So if I, if I had a family member who had lived through the Holocaust and I wanted to have an appreciation and an understanding of what that experience might have been like for them, I would pick up your memoir and I would read through so that I get an appreciation and an understanding of what it was like to be someone going through that experience. So it's a way of sharing our experiences. It's also a way of healing our own wounds and also to provide support to those who may be going through similar experiences. Now, I know some of you said that you wanted to contribute to your family legacy and your family history, that you wanted your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren to have an understanding of where you've been and where you've come from. And in my own experience recently, I've started digging into my family's past and into my family history. And um, my daughter's been doing some, re uh, some, some research and we can go back now to the 1500s and the 1400s in my family until documentation ceases to exist. And then we go on oral storytelling and oral traditions to fill in those gaps. And it's fascinating to have that recorded history of where we came from and who contributed to who we are today and how we ended up in Windsor, Essex, how we ended up in Canada even, and that trajectory and, and where did the family come from. 
So if that is your intention of writing your, your memoirs, just know that you know five or six, seven, eight generations from now, when they pick up your memoir or they read it digitally or however we're going to be communicating our stories in that time frame, your contribution to recorded history is going to be incredibly important to them. And finally, to create connection and encouragement and inspiration. When we write our memoirs, we are connecting with our audience. So when you have your storytelling triangle, you have you as the teller, whether that's spoken word or written word, you have the person who is the audience member. And in a written word, it's a very one-on-one -on -one intimate and immediate connection. If you're performing it or telling your story, it's a broader audience, depending on how many people are there. And then there's that third element, which is the story itself. So you have a relationship with your reader that you'll never maybe meet them face to face, but you have a relationship with them. You have a relationship with your story. There's a dynamic, there's a, there's a creative tension between you and your story that exists. And then there's the relationship that you don't actually get to participate in, which is the relationship between your story and your reader. And that's where the reader consumes your words, lets them sift through, percolate, digest them, and then have them resonate, they reflect on them, and maybe they actually apply what you have written to their own life circumstances, providing them with encouragement and inspiration that you didn't even intend. So as you're working through this story, the dynamic of your, of your memoir to your audience, you may never fully know unless they contact you and they very well might. But there is that relationship. And I just want to pause here for a second to tell you a, a story about the, the relationship between you and your story. So when you're writing your memoir, so you may have this trajectory in place, this way that you think it's going to unfold. And it may not, simply because of the nature of the memoir. I was writing a show recently and a play, and I was struggling with the plot line just a little bit. I wasn't really sure how I was going to transition it to the next phase. And I just kind of let the story sit. I mean, I had pretty good idea where I wanted to take it. And then I realized that it wasn't going to go there. If I took it where I wanted it to go, it was going to fall on its face. And the story itself, and for those of you that are writers in the room, consistent writers, you'll get this, right? The story basically said, no, that's not the trajectory. That's not the story that's supposed to be told. And so the story itself started to reveal itself to me. And I didn't want to write that story because one of my main characters was going to have to die. And I liked that main character. I did not want that to be her final outcome. But I also had to respect my relationship with my story my relationship with the narrative. And because I knew my theme and because I knew what I wanted to communicate, I had to respect, I had to step back from where I thought the story was gonna go. So I just wanna encourage you as memoirists that you may think you know what this story is supposed to be about, but I wanna encourage you and support you in saying, let the story reveal itself to you. Is there any questions so far in terms of what a memoir is or why you would want to write one? Or any comments? It doesn't have to be a question. Any comments, either in the chat or live? I just, how do I find out why I'm doing this? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question, right? And, and let's, let's work through, uh, I'll address that. And then let's work through some of the slides and see if we can't come to that point. So when you think about the story that you want to tell, the narrative that you want to share, there must have been a thought that came to you just before you said, you know what, I think I'm going to write that memoir. Do you remember what that might have been? Uh, I, like, I like to tell. <laughs> I, I I like to tell, and um, I, do, I don't think people are just being, my kids, for instance, I don't think they're just being polite when they like my stories or ask me to tell them about things, and I've always done that, and and there's this opportunity. I have, I have all my mother's letters from that time, 12 years of letters. 
from that time. And so uh, all the family, I've translated them and all my family has them, but they, there are so many stories in there. And mm -hmm. so I guess it's just that I, I like to tell. That's reason enough, quite honestly. Then next thing would be, I would go to the content of the letters. See if, the, see if you can pick out themes or patterns from those letters that might be in your heart significant to share and to tell. Well, there are lots of prompts. Okay. Uh, she well, writes, my mother wrote wonderful letters and there are all sorts of uh, incidents and things that she, that she relates, but, that, but I, I feel I need to elaborate. And that's sort of what I've been doing. I've, I've gotten quite a ways into this. So, but I, I keep questioning, you know, I'm, when, why am I doing this? And am I addressing this, you know, the way I'm doing it, is this the best way? I'm just, you know. It's I'm true gonna, though. And, and this is relevant, Dorothy, for, if you don't mind my calling you by your first name. Is no, that okay? no, not at all. Not at all. Um, I think that's relevant for all of us, right? I mean, sometimes we start just with the passion of telling, the passion of sharing, and you get knees deep and you go, what am I doing waiting in the weeds here? Just, you know, if you've done other writing, just stay the course. This is, this is one of the things that we have to wade through. And sometimes the, the most important theme or the, the pattern or the idea doesn't emerge until you have your first draft. And then you look back on it and you go, oh, look at how many times mom talked about X or look at my pattern of, it seems I felt compelled to elaborate on the stories that had these kinds of patterns or these kinds of messages to the next generation. So as much as we want to have a theme and an idea, it might not be the thing that is that you lead with. It might be the thing you edit with. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you don't have to necessarily know your, your deep core why you're writing it beyond this is really worth telling. This is really worth sharing. And that can be enough to get us started. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, yes, Linda. And may I address you by your first well, name as well? You've broached on something. Sure. Um, you've broached on something that I find really quite a challenge. You talked about, you know, writing away and the story is, is, is telling itself through you and you're going to go and do um, I don't know how many edits you go to until you arrive at a final draft. And I'm one of these people who sits there with the roadmap when I'm going somewhere and I plot out my course and I know where my stops are and everything gets memorized. And then if I finally sit down to write, I can focus on the writing. I don't have to focus on, the, on other details. I can just play with the language. I, I like what you said about um, the oral component of reading aloud, because even when I'm writing prose, even when I'm writing stuff that has nothing to do with uh, creativity, I read it out loud to hear how it sounds. It has to sound right before it will be right. Mm. So um, should I continue my turtle-esque ways and plot my map to where I want to go? For example, one of the things that's been causing me a lot of problems with Writing my own memoirs is the very points that you brought up. What are the themes and the patterns? And um, just before this hour, the theme suggested itself to me. I've been waiting for it to turn up for the last few weeks, and it just did. But um, is it better to just write and see what what rises to the top, or am I should I just do what I usually do and wait for the things to surface? Okay, are you ready? This is like the most profound thing. No, I'm kidding. But he, <laughs> do what works. For every person on this call who is a unique writer, you have your unique process. There are times, and I'm going to share a timeline, plot point, life map graphic with you in a couple of minutes. And sometimes that works beautifully for me. I need to know where I think the story is going from beginning to end. And I have to have that roadmap. 
Then the next thing that I do is I, I develop my characters. All right. So what's the story I want to tell and who's best to tell it? And just because of the way my, my brain works, once I have my characters kind of in my head, then I will go on online and I will look for visual images that represent what I think those characters might look like so that I can look at them and I can start working with them as three-dimensional entities. And then I do backstory work for them. And a, a different show that I'm working on currently, I, again, I couldn't, I could not advance the plot. I didn't know what to do with these, with this one particular character. I did not know what to do with her in the show. And I realized that I had not done her character backstory. I didn't know anything about her. So how could I have her do things? These are fictional works, of course, but I mean, nothing's purely fiction. We all write from what we know and what we experience. So I don't think there is anything as pure fiction. That's just my perspective. So sometimes I use a very structured plot line. Sometimes I just free write. Sometimes I use free writing to get me on my plot line. So if what you have done in the past is working for you, I would, I would suggest you continue to do that. If you've bumped into a problem or a challenge that you can't overcome using your old system, then yes, by all means, do a free write. Write three words at the top of the page, set your timer for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever you think is going to be comfortable, but push you just a little and just free write on those things and see if the very act of writing about something else frees you up creatively. Is that helpful? Okay, great. Thank you so much to both of you for asking your questions. And if anyone else wants to do so, um, please jump on board. So here we go, right? This is the practical stuff. It's nice to know what it is and it's nice to know why I might wanna do it or maybe I'm not even clear about that, but how do I do it? What are, the, what are the, the skills I have to have? What are the strategies that I need to use? How does all of this thing, how does all of this happen? So we've already talked about the most important theme. You might want, if it's not about what I think the most important theme is, it might be, what do I want people to walk away from this experience with? After they've finished hearing my memoir or reading my memoir, what do I want them to know? What do I want them to have learned? What do I want them to realize? And it might just be over the last several years in my, in my writing and is in, in private practice, my overarching theme has been, you are not alone not alone. And so when I write, there's that in the background. How do I convey that this one character is never really alone? No matter what they're going through, no matter how they feel, how do I convey that to them? So when they're done listening to my story or they're done watching my, my world storytelling day on, you know, in March of this year, when they're done hearing my story about lost and found, what do I want them to walk away with? So if you can't identify the most important theme, maybe think about your audience and what you want them to have when they're done with your, with your written work. When you have sort of decided, I wanna to write to tell a story, I wanna to write to share someone else's experiences, then we're gonna do that life map that I'm gonna show you the graphic in in a minute. Um, and maybe you've already done a similar exercise, but you want to capture all of those memories and all of those events related to your theme. So in terms of Holocaust, it might be the theme is survival. So as you're exploring the theme of survival, you're gonna say, okay, what are, the, what are the events? What are the memories? What are the interview lines that reinforce this concept of survival? If it's about contributing to my family legacy, how do I choose the memories and the events that bolster how we think about our family, how we feel about our family, taking pride in our family? What are those things that are our accomplishments? What are our successes? Now, of course, right, in order for it to be interesting writing, you need some tension, right? We call it conflict, but conflict implies that there's some kind of fighting going on. So I like the word tension better right? We keep with an elastic band when we've got some tension on it, we know there's some struggle, but we can also loosen the elastic band and there's some relief. So where are the moments of struggle? Where are the moments of tension? 
that can also reinforce your theme or your idea. How did we overcome? Maybe there's been a lot of fighting in your family and people have lost faith in, in, in even brothers and sisters getting along. Well, how do you relate that? What memories or events do you select to be able to relate to your life theme? You may also want to consult others. I mean, there's going to be gaps in your knowledge, especially if you're trying to capture a time in your life where you were quite young. And a lot of your memories might be planted. Uh, my daughter and I were having this conversation either today or yesterday. And I said, I have memories of my grandfather that can't possibly be my memories because he passed when I was three years old. But I know the story of peppermints in my grandfather's top shirt pocket. I know it as much as I'm sitting in this chair. Do I? Do I really remember the peppermints in my grandfather's pocket? Or do I remember hearing from my mother that my grandfather always had peppermints in his top shirt pocket? And when I was young, I would kind of reach and, and look for those peppermints. So you may have a memory, but you may want to check it out with a sibling or with friends or with other family members. Do you remember that time when? Or do you remember who slept in what bed in what room? Or do you remember, did we used to have a cottage or something? Or was that just a big tent? So you might want to check it out just to be able to validate or to verify what you're remembering and recalling. Speak truthfully and do no harm. This is, this is probably the biggest don't <laughs> on the list. We've already established that mem memoirs come from our memory. They are told from our perspective and they are filtered through our lenses. Well, maybe our memories of our parents, not so flattering. Maybe our memories of our siblings, not so great. But those memories can be influenced by a lot of things that may or may not reflect the reality of the other people in the family, in the community, in your experience. And as much as we have the right to share our memoirs, to share our stories from our perspectives, the big caution here is to not write your memoir, to publicly vent against your family and friends, or to conduct an emotional or psychological trial. Your family and your friends should not be on trial in your memoirs. It's not the place. If you really want to take someone to task, then may I suggest you write fiction and you change the characters enough that they don't recognize themselves as themselves and then have at it. Especially if your relatives are still living. They're going to pick up your memoir. That's where autobiographies can get kind of dicey too. <laughs> but they're going to pick up your memoir and they're going to read it. And not only are they going to pick up your memoir and read it, their friends and family are going to pick up the memoir and read it and go, wow, you were really nasty to your sister. Or did you, how could you possibly treat your brother so badly? And you're kind of going, oh, well, that's not how I remember it. So memoirs intended thematically to encourage and to support and to inspire. And if we can't do that without naming names and without sort of dragging the laundry through the public, uh, public uh, domain, <laughs> might wanna think about your theme, especially now with social media. I mean, it will go around the world like that especially if it's titillating and, and, you know, lots of gossip in it. So please be aware of the power of your memoir. That was kind of rough, right? Anybody have any comments on that? that yes. All right. Thank you so much, Dorothy. <laughs> I appreciate that endorsement. <laughs> and then finally, we want to make sure that we're telling or we're showing and we're not just telling. So it is a memory, right? It is an event. It is an experience. So share it with your audience expressively. Look for those powerful verbs. Look for those 
feelings that you want to come across? How do we show that we were scared? How do we show that we were sad? And knowing that sadness is very often the, the emotion underneath anger. So if you're writing a memoir and you have a very angry relative, are you willing to explore that? Show me their anger, but then are you willing to show me what might be underneath that anger that is driving them forward? And you've mentioned, you know, a couple of you about family histories and the Holocaust. I mean, you are talking about very complex circumstances and situations and very complex emotions. And how did they compensate? How did they cope? Some families never spoke of it again. Some folks, some families spoke of it often so that their, their subsequent generations would have an understanding of what they had experienced. So show more than tell and use those emotion words so that we really get a feel for um, what your, your memory is or what your loved one's memory was. Those connections that I shared with you earlier about the connection between you and your story, you and your reader and your reader and your story. So that then every element of the story that you're sharing connects back to your theme and back to your audience. What do I want them to learn? What do I want them to know? What do I want them to take away with them? You may also want to include how these lived experiences affect your life today. So let's suppose you're sharing, I was working with a client a while back that had been in a terrible car accident. And it was a story about resilience. That was the theme that they wanted to develop. And so the, the memories and the experiences were chosen to reflect that. And also how resilience continues to impact their life today. How does that accident continue to show up? How do they have to call upon that inner strength, even though they've healed physically? Because the emotional and the psychological scars are taking a lot longer to heal. And when they go out to go into their car, those flashbacks of what happened the day of the accident. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to encourage and support and inspire by not just sharing the actual thing, but how it continues to affect, it's called applied learning, right? So you've heard the story, here's how it continues to affect me and here's how it might affect you as well. Please find your individual voice and share your narrative from that perspective. Not asking you to write your memoir from someone else's perspective. It's not gonna feel authentic to you, first of all, and it's not going to feel authentic to the participants or the audience members or the people who are reading your book. If you're a talker, keep the memoir conversational. Did I tell you about the time? And here's what happened. And here's how I felt. And here's how it still lingers in my life today. If you're funny, write with a humorous, lighter touch. Jokes are tricky. Not many people can tell a joke well. Otherwise, we would all be stand-up comics. But if you have a light touch to life, if you want to share a very dark time in your life, you can still have it with a light touch. I think it was three, year, three years ago, I was asked to write a play on senior abuse, elder abuse. And could I please make it a comedy? Wow, that's, that's some tricky writing because how do you take such a heavy topic and write it in a way that is light. And I remember opening night, standing at the back of the theater with the director and going, okay, here comes the first line that is supposed to be funny. I hope it lands because if this one doesn't land, the rest of the show is in real trouble. And I remember holding my breath for like a couple of seconds. The line was delivered, there was a beat and there was laughter. So it can be done. You can, touch, you can talk about these most serious experiences and, and treat it in a way that's not funny, funny. Like we're not trying to be, get belly laughter here, but there's a lightness in the sharing that allows people to continue to breathe through your experience. I'm working on a show right now on the experience of senior citizens living through COVID. That's a very tricky show to write because we're still in it and we're still isolated. And we're still coming out of the emotional consequences and the psychological consequences of that. But there are moments in the show where we laugh, where we point at ourselves and we go, oh my goodness, do you remember when we did that? Do you remember how silly we must have looked doing those things? 
So if your memoir is heavy, find your unique voice. And that's where knowing what you want to say is so important because when you know what you want to say, you have a better idea of who's gonna say it and how to say it to be able to deliver the message. The next thing is please remember and forget simultaneously everything you learned in English class at school. Yes, we do have to respect certain grammar rules and regulations. This is a memoir. So you get some creative license. Maybe your character doesn't always speak in complete sentences. Maybe your character swears once in a while because that was just Uncle Jimmy's personality. And I didn't know what to do with it. My mom would come up and put her hands over my ears so I didn't hear those bad words. Maybe you have to include those kinds of things. Maybe there's no punctuation. Maybe it's a run on sentence. As long as you can justify the breaking of the rule because it contributes to the story and develops the theme. And please write a memoir that you would like to read. What makes it engaging? What do you like in a story? What do you like in a compelling memoir? Do you like to read memoirs that are only told from a female perspective? Do you like to read memoirs that are only written from the masculine per perspective? Do you like to be engaged with conflict? Does it have to be just tension? Is, there, is it only engaging if you have several of Joseph Campbell's archetypes in a memoir? What does it mean to be entertained? Do you like a beginning and a middle and an end? Do you like to start at the end and then have the beginning and then end with the middle? All of those kinds of, what makes it entertaining for you? And then because of the nature of, me of memoir, how does it edify? How does it make me better having read it than before I read it? How am I different or changed? And perhaps the most important thing that when you are now neck deep in this thing, you might forget, have fun. Remember why you wanted to write this thing in the first place. What is it that I want to share? And come back to that. That becomes your anchor for your story. So here are examples of those life maps. And you can create them any way that you want. And I don't know, Linda, if this is what you have used in the past, if it's looked like this, this is just a Google grab of some images that came up. I've done this, um, I've done it with students. I've done it with clients who are working through difficult challenges. It helps us to put our life in perspective. Yeah, we've got some great times and some, some amazing memories. And we've got some other times that were really hard to get through and we slogged through. When I do this particular exercise with individuals, I will have them identify, they can either make the map and then plot point the, the events and experiences, or they can put, they can do a brain dump and put everything on the page and then link it from activity to event to activity to event. Maybe you can't draw, maybe you don't wanna use words. So I have folks identify with dark dots so a small dark dot is a negative experience in their life or a perceived negative experience that may 20 years later have been the best thing that ever happened to you. But at the time, that perceived negative experience. And then um, a star or a heart for a positive experience. And it, again, it might be a very positive experience in the moment that ends up being a dark experience 20 years later. The more negative the experience, the bigger and darker the circle, the more positive the experience, the darker and the bigger the heart or the star. And I just have people plot their lives and then go back and look at, if I'm writing a story on resilience, where are those moments where I was resilient? And where are those moments that forced me to become more resilient and link those? So I wanna give you, we started a couple of minutes late, but I do wanna give you a, about five minutes to just pause on everything that you've heard so far and take some notes. So it might be reflecting on, so it's a free write for you. Why do I wanna write this memoir? Who am I writing this memoir for? Maybe you're gonna do your grocery list of all of the events that might tie to your theme or your most important theme. Maybe you wanna take five minutes and start the life map, the timelines and the plot point. So we, I'm gonna give you five minutes I'm gonna set my timer. I'm gonna mute myself so I don't interrupt you. 
If you have any questions, raise your hand or you can chat to, you can send me a private chat. And then we're gonna come back and I'm gonna give you an opportunity to share what you created during your five minute free write. So five minutes starting as soon as I set my clock. So maybe you'll get five minutes and a half starting now. All right, it is your time to share. Is there anyone that would like to share what they spent their five minutes writing about? Either their most important theme or starting their life map or their plot points. Uh, this last couple of minutes, you can either share either in the chat, you don't have to come and on, be online and camera and microphone. Um, you can share in the chat. Or if you have any questions based on what I shared with you tonight or any comments in conclusion, we have just about three or four minutes. Flora, the floor is open. Hi everyone, thank you so much. I'm really appreciating um, this, Linda, it's wonderful. What I did with that time, I've never seen um, that life map um, graphically before. So I decided I'd try and track all the places I've lived. Um, <laughs> so I only got halfway through um, and and trying to do that graphic because I'm, you know, I'm finding the older I get, the less precise I remember. And, um, you know, I'm sure I'm leaving places out. So, yeah, um, but I found that really, I just found that a really nice way to um, track the movements of my life in a different way. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for that feedback. Yeah, it's a great yeah. exercise. Uh huh. For sure. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, Dorothy. I think that 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 you're up. Okay. Um, yes. Um, and I. This is this has been uh, amazingly helpful, and I've got copious notes. And uh, and uh, what came? What I was reminded that I I I have a, a book. It's in German, unfortunately, on my. German is not as fluent as it used to be, so I have struggling with it. But the point of the book basically is that the um, the the oppressor, those that were the oppressors in a conflict, can also be victims, and mm -hmm. there are victims, and um, the the guilt we feel has silenced us for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, you know, I hear people talking about the Holocaust and I immediately shut down because um, that is very uncomfortable. And so my, our ordeals, our um, difficulties uh, and downright suffering and danger during and after the war is, uh, has you know can't be considered significant, but of course it is, mm -hmm. and so that I think that is um, that has certainly gotten me back to writing this. I started it about twenty years ago, and I had I'd largely neglected it, and then I a friend recommended this book, and um, so this has sort of given me a reason for speaking up uh, and writing this because not to defend myself or, or, or the, you know, the German people, but just to mm, realize that um, we weren't, all, and not everybody was the oppressor and there were many, many victims um, both during and after the war. And so that's kind of a big part of the story. Yeah, and, and to your point, it's not a voice we hear often. And, and when we talk about oppression, um, I, I do a workshop with my partner on anti-oppression and allyship. And, and that's a whole, like there are, there are the oppressed and then in, in another situation or another environment, the oppressor becomes the oppressed. And when we think that our experience isn't as significant or isn't of as high a priority as someone else's, we tend to, we tend to close ourselves down. So thank you for, for finding within yourself um, the story that needs to be told. Thank you. Um, I also see in the chat that GB said that they wrote on the theme of the lost connection and Sharon, her theme of survival and healing. Okay, great. Thank you so much. 
Um, thank you everyone for being here tonight. We've run a couple of minutes over. I, I apologize for that, but I think it was worth it. I mean, I loved the last two minutes and hearing what you all had to say. So I trust that it was a, a good evening for you too. I will uh, stop my sharing. And I just want to once again say thank you to all of you who were here tonight, who shared um, and took part. It's always a delight to lead a workshop. I love doing this stuff. And as I said earlier, if there's anything that I can continue to be a support to you on, uh, please don't hesitate to use my email. And thank you once again to Lois and uh, Windsor Film and Digital Media for allowing me to facilitate this workshop tonight. Mm -hmm.